Good evening. I'm just coming back from uh, California now. I was in LA and in uh, San Diego. Every event I ever had over there was always successful, Baruch Hashem. One of these places, no matter where you speak, lots of people come. I think one of the reasons is because they don't have that much activity like here. Not lectures every night, different places. People are more excited when a speaker comes to town. Plus, when they know someone comes from far, they try to promote better. The lecture is usually successful when they have a good promoter. Promotes, he sends messages, a lot of people come. We're going to make a Shabbaton in Hanukkah, Shabbat of Hanukkah. If you're interested with myself and uh, there's going to be some music in a Poconos. It's limited space. This is the flyers over here. It will be very nice Shabbaton from Friday to Sunday. Please take advantage on the Shabbat of Hanukkah. Uh, we're going to speak today about Parashat Vayetze. Parashat Vayetze, speaking about 20 years of the life of Yaakov. When he was forced to stay out of the land of Israel, from the time that Hashem said to his grandfather Abraham, Lech lecha me'artzecha, leave your land when he was 75 years old, El Aretz Asher Areka, to the land I'm going to show you, the fathers did everything they can not to leave Israel, unless if they were forced by, you know, hunger or things like that. Now Yaakov is forced to leave the house of his father. He's forced to go to a place that he's not interested to go. Why? Because he's afraid for his life. Pikuach Nefesh, his brother Esav is looking to kill him. Even when Yaakov go overseas, he doesn't take Eretz Israel one minute of his mind. He knows that's his destination. After he makes his neder, his vow, when he goes to the Moriah mountain, and he has this special dream when the angels go up and down the ladder, one of the things that he says in his vow is, Veshavti el bet avi. All I want is to return back to my homeland. And this is, uh, as we all know, we have a rule in life. Maase avot siman lebanim. If our fathers, Eretz Israel, was so precious for them, then it has to stay like this until the end of all the generations. Every Jew has to do everything he can to always want and expect and do everything he can to make Aliyah to Eretz Israel. And we're not going to get into this subject because I already made it clear a few times in the past who is allowed to move to Israel and who is not allowed. Who is allowed to leave Israel and who is not allowed. There are rules. Everything in life has rules. But well, one thing for sure, one thing for sure you do you don't ever replace maybe with, you don't replace certain with maybe. Something that you have in your hand, you don't replace with something that possibly, you can possibly have. So if everything works for you here, you don't take a risk and go to something that maybe you will have and something you may not have. Yesterday when I spoke in California in my second lecture of the night, there was a very large audience, and they had a microphone. And it was working fine. I don't know, the microphone was fine. The only problem is that I had to hold it, because they didn't have a stand. So in the middle of the lecture, they bought a real professional microphone, like a real nice, with a stand, with sound, sound like in a studio. So in the middle of the lecture, they replaced. They took the one from my hand, and they put this one in. But then this one started to have echo and whistling. You know how it is? For maybe two minutes, in the middle of the recording, we have to lower the echo and this. 
So I say to them, you see, according to the Torah, you should have not replaced the microphone. Why? Something that works, you don't replace that with something that may work or may not work. Something that works. If it doesn't work, what do you have to lose? Worse comes to worse. You, you replace it with something that doesn't work. But if it works, you don't take the risk. Later, the, the second microphone, once they fixed it, it was a lot better, fine. Uh, but this is just to give you an idea. You have something in your hand, you don't gamble. You don't have anything in your hand, you have nothing to lose. So, the Rebbe from Gur, Sfat Emet, which was a giant Chacham, he said the mind of Yaakov Avinu never left Israel even when he was overseas. 20 years later, when he comes back to the house of his father, as it says in the end of the chapter, Yaakov went to his journey, and the angels of God met him. Rivka gives a hint to that when she said to Yaakov, once he's leaving to Haran, she said, you have to run away from your brother. He's angry now. Sit by my family for a few days. A few days turned to 20 years. Right? So she blessed her son that even though now you have to go to overseas, it's only temporary. Don't think, God forbid, to settle there and to stay there. You have in, uh, in, in America, you have hundreds of thousands of Israelis. Most of them came to America for one reason. It's not the Holy Land here. Right? Why they came to America? One word. Starts with M. Huh? Mama. <laughs> money. Money, money, money. Opportunities, jobs. It's very interesting how when I travel, I see Israelis that came here, and within a few months, they became millionaires. The American dream, even in these days, that it's not such great opportunities. I met now on my trip a few young men. Interesting how they started open one store and another store, and then all of a sudden they have 19 big stores. Within not even three, four years, they built a nice, nice chain of stores. How they did it so quick, when Hashem wants a person to become wealthy, nothing can limit that. Huh? Amrika. Amrika. Umareka. Empty, empty nation. One more thing. Chazal, our sages, they see the identity of Am Israel, Torah Israel, and Eretz Israel. There is, there is connection between the identity of the nation of Israel, the Torah of Am Israel, and the land of Israel. A Jew cannot fulfill himself, cannot fulfill his potential until he comes to the promised land, into the holy land, and is able to sit over there and to reach a very high perfect level. Yitzhak Avinu was in Israel all his life. He did not leave Israel. But Avraham and Yaakov, they, were, they went back and forth. Avraham came from Aram Naharaim, which is Kurdistan, Kurdish land, you know, between Iraq, Iran, Turkey, that area. He came to Israel. Then he had to leave Israel to the opposite direction, to Egypt. Then he came back to Israel. Yaakov had to run to Aram Naharaim. He ran away to Kurdistan. And then he came back, and then he had to go to Egypt. So it's very similar, the life of Abraham and the life of his grandson, Yaakov. When did Yaakov return for the final time into Israel? When he died. They brought him in his funeral, right? Which is a big question, because there's a question now, if you're allowed to bring a Jew that died, if you're allowed to bring his body into Israel. According to the halacha, you're allowed. According to the Kabbalah, you're not allowed. 
you have to bring him when he's alive, not when he died. After he died, you don't bring the bodies. Bury him in overseas. Why? Because it's impurifying the land. Dead body is impure. You don't bring something not pure into the pure land. After he died, that's it. This is tuma. The body has tuma. So the Zohar said, Lote tamu et artsi. That's what it means. Don't bring dead bodies into my land. But the halacha is not like that. This is a perfect example of how the halacha and the Kabbalah not always rule the same. You may ask, wait a minute, but it's one Torah, no? It's one origin. It comes from one God. What is the truth? The truth is that you're allowed or not allowed? Good or not good? How can it be two opposite opinions? The answer is, many people think that if in one thing you have two different opinions, that both one of them is correct and the other one is incorrect. First, it's not true. Sometimes both opinions are correct. Now, because both opinions are different, but they both correct, you have to choose one of the two and to go by it. You cannot go one day left, one day right. You have to decide. So that's one thing. Second, I give you an example. Here you have a bottle of water. If, I, if me and him has to describe it, we both describe the same bottle, right? But when we write our description, me and him will be different. I will, will describe the barcode and the star over here and those words, and he will describe the tree and this. And when two people look at that, they actually think that we talk about two different things. But in reality, we both describe the same thing from a different point of view. Two people looking now at the camera. When, I, when you ask me, the screen of the camera is on the right side or on the left side, I'm going to say it's on the right side. But when we're going to ask Michael, he's going to say it's on the left side. We both say the truth, even though it's the opposite. The truth can be described in different ways. This is another example. I'll give you another example. Sometimes there is different truth to different situations and to different people. Let me ex explain. The Rambam writes, the Rambam, the biggest Chacham in al in the last thousand years, the Rambam writes, the nights were not given to waste it on sleep. The nights were given to sit all night and learn Torah. Everyone that learns Torah at night has a special line, comes directly from God on his head. Special line of mercy, blessing. Then in another place, the Rambam writes, a person needs to sleep well, to sleep well because it's good for the health. If he's a weak person, he needs to sleep eight hours. If he's average, seven hours. If it's healthy, nice, young, whatever, six hours. Not less than six hours. Why you need to sleep six hours? It's healthy. Every, all the information you learn and heard during the day settle nicely in the brain. The night is divided to two hours, two hours, and two hours. Different things happen in the brain when you sleep. All the information that you heard during the day settle and they go to where they're supposed to go. If you don't sleep well, then you have problem with memory, with focusing. That's the way of life. So in that case, which one of the two is correct? The nights were given to sleep that all the information that you learn will absorb well in the brain and will be stored properly? Or if someone goes to sleep, he's actually sinning, wasting the night instead of making a five, 10,000 mitzvot or 100,000 mitzvot of learning Torah, He's snoring in his bed. The answer depends who asks. If an ordinary person asks this question, someone who goes to work, he has a store, you know, stu student, col uh, college student, uh, a driver, people like that, a barber, or, you know, people, the ordinary people, religious. They say, I want to stay all night and I want to be able to learn Torah all night, and then he has to work all day in a hard job. Uh, one week he'll collapse, he'll die. Why? He cannot do it. Then you have to tell him, no, you have to sleep six, seven, even eight hours, depend, because they, you know that he's not going to make it. But someone that is a very high level of learning, learns many years, 
and he cannot live without the Torah. And the Torah, it's all his life. Someone like that has a special siata dishmaya that he will manage with one or two hours sleeps at night. It's enough. The Gaon Mivinna, he slept half an hour, half an hour, half an hour, every 24 hours. One and a half hours, that's it. Avovadi Yosef Zatzal, in our generation, even when he was 90, he was learning until 2-3 o'clock at night, every night. And then 2-3 hours later, he was up to, to learn again. Sometimes they had meetings in the morning, they, got, they come from the government. So even when he was 90 years old, and was sick, he had an open heart surgery once, and ballooning, and all kinds of things, and sugar, and blood pressure, and yet, he was learning Torah in every possible minute. Same thing, two people came to Rabbi Ben-Zion, Abba Shaul, and they say to him, one say to him, Rabbi, I want to learn all nights also. I'll sleep a little bit after Shachrit, one or two hours, and that's it. The rest I'll learn all the time. He told him, no, no, no. You have to sleep at night, sleep well, that you can learn good during the day. Then somebody else asked, he said, no, how long did it take you to figure it out that you have to learn all night? Two guys, the same yeshiva. Why? The rabbi knows the ability of each one. Same thing when you have two kids, they're not the same. If one of them get a hundred on a test, it's nothing special. You expect it. Anything less than that, it's failure. If one person got 70, another kid, it's not exactly the Gaon Mivilna. So if he got 70 for him, it's pretty good. Usually he gets 40, 50. This one, he got 70. You got to give him something to acknowledge it, to, to encourage him that the next time will get just as good. The other one that gets 100, if he gets 95, he's disappointed. He's disappointed. He said, oh, he's on the way down. God forbid. So and then the person with the 95, he said, what kind of a father you are? I got 95, he got 70, you're, giving him a, you're making him a party, and to me you say that it's failure, right? The answer is, everything is according to the expectation and the potential. I'll give you an example. Who was greater, Moshe or Aaron? Who was greater? If we have to rate, of course it's not our place to rate people, but we can only rate them based on what the Torah rated them. Same thing I say to someone when I was in California now, a girl that wants to marry a black goy. I explained to her that Jews are not allowed to marry goyim, but she grew up in public school and now you pay the price. That's what happened. So I say to her, if I would come and tell you you're not allowed to marry a goy, then it sounds like racism. Why, he's not as good as us? Why, he's not a human being? He's not polite, he's not nice, he's not smart. The Torah said the Goyim, they can be smart. They have nice manners, some of them. It's no contradiction. So I say to her, if a person made up the law, then he's a simple racist. And racism is something very bad. But if it's written in a book of God that even the Gentiles admit that it's the book of God, and he said to the Jews, you are my children, I chose you to be special, you are holy because I'm holy. Don't be like the Gentiles. They're not as good as you. you are, from you I'm expecting a lot more. Not that the Gentiles cannot convert and become regular Jews. They have this option. They can elevate themselves. And some Gentiles go to heaven and some Jews do not have it. A Jew that is not Shomer Shabbat has no share to the world to come. His soul gets cut for eternity. Nothing will help him, nothing. Even if he's a nice person, even if he gave a lot of tzedakah, even if he did, he had kosher, nothing will help him if he's Mechalel Shabbat. Because Mechalel Shabbat is 100% like a goy in the eyes of Hashem. If he dies, you cannot bury him in a Jewish cemetery. That's how bad it is. You have to make a wall. You understand? And his punishment is bigger than a murderer. What do you think, it's a joke to be Mechalel Shabbat? I wish the kids of this generation would be a little bit more clever to understand what they do. They think, ah, big deal, what am I doing? Texting. Texting, what texting? Every time you touch it, the light goes on. Electric goes on. Wires are heating up inside. All kinds of things are happening. 
It can be every time you press a button, it's another separate Chilul Shabbat. You know, all these things that people do. So Mechalel Shabbat is a very serious violation. Not that many, many people know that even you're not allowed to bury Mechalel Shabbat with murderers. It's, you're not allowed. The murderers getting upset. That's the law. If you have a section full of murderers, filthy murderers, garbage people, garbage. A murderer is a human being, I'm asking you. Someone who killed someone else is a human being. He deserves to live. What can be worse than a murderer? What? It's basically the, the bottom of the bottom. And yet, Mechalel Shabbat, in the eyes of Hashem, is worse. And the people do not understand that. If all Jews would understand that, the situation would be a lot better today. But they don't, because of ignorance. The problem is that ignorant or not ignorant, one day they die and they realize the mistake they made, but now they cannot fix it. So let me ask you a question. According to the Torah, the Torah say, Moshe and Aaron are equal. But in another place it says, no one is great like Moshe. Moshe is the master of all the prophets, is the most humble ever lived. Hashem spoke to him face to face, is the only person in history. And his position was higher than Aaron. He was the main king. Aaron was important, but he wasn't the king. So in that case, why Moshe and Aaron are equal? It looks like a contradiction. The answer is, they both fulfill the same level of potential. Everybody has potential in life. Not everyone can be Rav Eliashiv. What do you think? Everyone who goes to Yeshiva can be Rav Ovadia? How many people learn the same amount of years like Rav Ovadia from his own class and nobody even know who they are? And they learn serious. We're not talking about people that went to a, on a picnic. People that learn seriously Torah all their life and nobody knows who they are. They didn't have the skills of the Siata Dishmaya like him. Not everyone is equal. If you learn 20 years and your friend learn 20 years, you may become a very big rabbi and your friend just become an average student with the same amount of investment. Maybe sometimes the one that is not as anonymous maybe invents, invested more efforts than you. But you still achieve a, a, a much higher level. But the way it's, a person is judged is not by his achievements like this world. In this world, nobody cares about the efforts. They only care what's the bottom line. You fix the problem or not? You fix it, here is your money. You did not, you did not fix it, not only you don't get paid, you get sued. But I worked 30 hours, I put my life into it. Your problem, not mine. You don't know how to fix, quit. You fix, here is your money. You did not fix, goodbye. You come here with a suit to the dry clean. Can you remove the stain? He looks, of course. How much? $10. When is it ready? Tomorrow. You come the next day, the stain is there. Hey, what's this? I gave it to you to remove the stain. Yeah, we tried our best. Believe me, we worked three hours on it. We usually 10, 15 minutes, we clean the suit. Here we worked three hours and we couldn't remove it. You're gonna pay him? Very sorry, it's your problem. You told me you can remove it, otherwise I wouldn't bring it. You take the suit and you upset why you wasted two days of your time. But by Hashem it's not like that. He gives us the reward based on our efforts, not our success. And that's what makes us very, very lucky. Imagine if he would only pay us based on success. He would not pay to try. Because most of us are big failures. Did we ever did something substantial in our life? Well, we achieve any, go any of our goals? Do you know one person that can raise his hand over here and say, I used to be very proud and arrogant, huge ego, and now I'm perfectly humble. Do you know anyone here that can raise his hand? If someone would raise his hand, that's a sign that I'm right. And he's still full of ego. <laughs> because a humble person won't raise his hand. I used to be proud, now I'm very humble. You know how the Chilonim say, Ani Tzadik. As soon as a person goes like this in Israel, Ani Tzadik, answer him, you just prove how much you rasha. 
משה רבנו רוצה אני צדיק, רב בן ציון רוצה אני צדיק, רב עובדיה רוצה אני צדיק, ועד כהנו וחכם רוצה אני צדיק. It's impossible. If a person thinks אני צדיק, for sure he's not a צדיק. For sure. Why? Because a real צדיק, he knows I'm far from being perfect. Acknowledging the fact that you're far from being perfect, that's a very positive thing. Because if a person lives in illusion that is perfect, one day this illusion will explode in his face. The illusion does not last forever. One day you have to deal with the consequences. Right? If a person eats something that causes cancer, it doesn't happen overnight. It may take 20 years. Another gram, another gram, another gram, another gram. 20 years later, one day he feels fatigue, goes to the doctor, they check. Shem Yerachem, you have two months to live. It's a process. It's not something that happened right away. Eventually, a person has to deal with the consequences. Whatever he did wrong, he will pay the price. Nobody gets away with the price. The price is there. You must pay the price. Unless if a person does real tshuva. If he does real tshuva, he can get away with the price, with the, with the punishment. So Moshe, let's say Moshe fulfilled 98% of his potential. Obviously, no one is an angel. One or two mistakes he made in his life, that's already not 100%. So if he fulfilled 98% of his potential from the 100%, that's what made him Moshe Rabbeinu, the legend, the humble, the, 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 the righteous, the holy, etc. And Aaron fulfilled 98% of his potential, but he did not make him Moshe, a little bit less. But it doesn't matter, for Hashem they're equal. So sometimes you see two people in the yeshiva, one knows so much, and it's shining, the other one nobody pays attention to. But yet it could be that the other one is more important in Shamaim because he achieved more than, on his potential than the other one. The only problem is that his potential wasn't so high to begin with. You can see from a childhood which kid will be big chacham and which one will not. Sometimes you see, you talk to a kid, poor kid, he's dumb, his mind doesn't work cannot understand one thing from another. It doesn't have wisdom. It's very difficult to teach wisdom. Very difficult. It's a gift. It's a talent you're born with. You see right away, you have a little kid. It's like a little demon. Very clever. Everything you understand right away. You move your nose, you already know what you wanted to say to your wife. The other one, you speak clear, clearly in his face, he still doesn't get it. But the other one, as soon as you move your hand, you already, ah, oh, I know why you did that. That's show that this person is clever, is wise. Mevin davar mitoch davar, that's called bina. Chokhmah bina vadat. You hear something, a good speaker, he feels the crowd. You need few talents to be a good speaker. One, you need to know your material, that's one thing. Without it, how are you gonna come and talk? But all the speakers that come to talk, they know their material. Otherwise, they would not stand on a stage not knowing what to say. So they know what, they, what they're about to say. But not everyone has the talent to present it in an interesting way. So you need charisma and to know how to entertain the people. You know where to speak strict, when to lower, where to go too long, where to cut, to do short. And plus, you have to feel the audience, meaning you have to, you have to know body language. You see how the people see it. If you see, they enjoy every minute. Very good, it's the time to hit now. If you see, they begin to get nervous. They move to the edge of the chair. They put their hands on their knees. They're ready to get up already. It's body language. But if you see, they sit like this, and they're in a dream, they enjoy the minute. Talk until tomorrow, you feel it. Then you allow yourself to say more. But if you know they're already moving, this, that, sometimes it's the cigarette. The cigarette. Not that he's not, he, he loved the lecture, but the cigarette kills him. Moshe, already one hour he didn't smoke. You're crazy, you're gonna be sick. <laughs> it's not healthy. <laughs> I know. Uh, now, now I'm gonna speak by the Syrians here on Thursday. So the guy called me today. He said, Rabbi, I know when you start, you can go on and on. 
Can I make a request? I say, what? He said, is it possible after an hour to give 10 minutes break? I say, why? He said, listen, you know, people need to get up. They want to smoke something, but they don't want to lose the lecture. So they sit, but they don't enjoy because they have the animal instinct. The animal wants to get what they, what they want to eat. The body is an animal. What's the body? So I say, of course, no problem. But he doesn't know one thing. If you make a break in a lecture, you, you kill the lecture. Fair, some of the people go home. Because as soon as you stop, the Yetzirah penetrates. The Yetzirah is just like a snake, like a deceiver. You know, the, the crooks, they don't come right away to steal. They first become friendly. As soon as you open the door, it gadal v'it kadash merabah. You're done. That's it. That's why the rich people, many of them, when they see a rabbi, they avoid contact with him. They don't want to be too friendly. Why? Because they know as soon as they smile to him and say, how are you? Right away he's going to say, you know, I have yeshiva, we are doing very bad. <laughs> that hello would cost me $20,000. So he pretends he doesn't see him. <laughs> Not everyone, of course. But there are people, they're afraid. Some of them went one step further. They assigned a messenger to deal with them. Don't talk to me. I can be friendly with you. So why don't you help me if you like me so much? I'm not involved with the money, with the charity. Talk to my guy. No, but you, you can also write a check. It's your money, your guy. No, no, but we have a rule. I don't, need, I don't push my nose into his business. He doesn't push his nose into So like this, I can hug you, kiss you, tfadal, chacham, sit. Fifty dollars you don't get. Why? You have to go to my gabai. You understand? All these tricks, it looks very productive. He gets what he wants. I promise you, when he comes to Olam Abba, he'll pull his hair off for a million years. Especially when they die, they leave a billion, two billion, ten billion, five hundred million, which will go to waste anyway. And then they're going to kill themselves and say, you see, I was avoiding all these people. At least now, if, they, if I give them 10,000, 20,000, 5,000, 30,000, I had another 20, 30 million dollar charity to take with me to where I go. That's when they realize their mistake. You understand? Right now, they don't. They think, oh, I got away with that. Wow, Shabbat Baruch Hashem. Shir Lama'alot. Moshe, why you say Teilim? That that rabbi didn't see me. Shir Lama'alot. <laughs> you understand? But like they say in Israel, tzohek, mi she tzohek acharon. We'll see who would laugh in the end. So Chazal say, you know, Am Israel, Torah Israel, Eretz Israel, to become perfect, you cannot avoid the Holy Land. It's a, it's a level by itself. And all the things that they journeyed, that they went one from another, Yaakov, in the end, was brought, after he forced Yosef to swear to him, he was brought back to Israel in his funeral. Why did Yaakov made Yosef swear to him and not the other brothers? Because Yosef had the power. The other ones couldn't promise something that it's not in their hand. How old was Yaakov when he left the house of his parents? No? 63. Where was he supposed to go to? To Haran. Haran, it's hinting Haron. Haron Af. Haran, it's anger. Place of anger. But instead of going to Haran, he changed his path. Where did he go? He went to Jerusalem. What was in Yerushalayim? Yeshivat Shem Vaever. How many years he got stuck there? Fourteen years to learn Torah. What age he went to Be'er Sheva after he finished in Yeshiva? He never finished in Yeshiva unless you decide to leave. He arrived to Be'er Sheva when he was 77. 
And from Be'er Sheva, he went to the direction of Haran, as his father ordered. And this is where the parasha begins. Vayetze Yaakov mi Be'er Sheva vayelech Harana. Remember, now, it's just when he finished the 14 years in Yeshiva. But the 14 years of Yaakov Avinu in Yeshiva wasn't like today, 14 years in Yeshiva. It was 14 years that he did not go to sleep. He did not go to sleep. And the Torah, Yaakov Avinu, he finished learning now Torah, he's 77. Not one drop of sperm came out of his body yet in his life. 77 years old. Only 10 years later, nine years later, when he gives birth to Reuven, there was the first drop of seed that came from his body after 86 years. That's what he said, Reuven Reshit Oni. On with Aleph, it's the power, the energy, the power of a person. What's the energy? The more a person weighs seed, the weaker he becomes. It makes his teeth loose. It makes his underarm smell. He makes him, it makes him lose hair. It makes his mouth always, his breath always stink. It makes his eye vision not as powerful. It's basically destroyed every aspect of the health of a person. It makes him weak and he cannot move. And it's Marash taking away all the energy of a person. This is what King Solomon says. The more a person does it, the more sick he becomes, the faster he dies, everything in his life, and the blessing, and the parnassah. Basically, there's nothing that a person can do to cause himself more damage than wasted. That's why the Kabbalah compare it to murder. Nothing less than that. Compare it to murder. That's how bad it is. The Rambam writes, the Rambam wasn't a Kabbalist. He didn't have the Zohar, the Rambam. Some say in the last year of his life, he got a copy of it. And he said that when he started to look at the Kabbalah, that if he had, not, he had known those things before, some of the rulings that he made would have been different. Maybe it happened, maybe not. We don't have a proof. Maybe it's only a story. Not every story you hear, you have to put your life on it. Some of the stories are real. Some of them people a little bit exaggerate. They had an agenda. Just like by the Goim, they invent a lot of fairy tales. We don't have to believe every story we hear. It's possible, pass, very possible that it really happened. But it's also possible that people make up things. I'll give you an example. Today in the internet, people make a lot of lies. They make fake stories. To begin with, the stories are made to attract attention for a few days until people will find out that it was a scam. So people actually mamash invent lies. And how quick it goes all over the internet, within hours, million people see it. And then come the disappointment. False alarm. It wasn't really 250 years ago, it was only a week ago that it was written. That changed everything. Put you on. Yeah. <laughs> so now, when Yaakov arrived to the city of Haran, right away he started, right away he started to think, I pass by the Moriah mountain and I did not go to pray there. Why, what's so special to go pray there? This is the place that my father was almost slaughtered, Akeda, Yitzchak, and my grandfather, Abraham. I have to go pray there. He turned around, he went to the city of Luz. When Hashem saw it, Mamash, he made him a miracle. It wasn't like today, you get on your motorcycle and one hour later you're there. Yeah, people needed to walk or to on a donkey. It will take forever. And then when he arrived to the area, the day ended faster. If the day is supposed to finish, eight, seven o'clock sunset. Why? That Yaakov will be able to pray there to Filat Arvit. After that, he put 12 rocks around his head. And Hashem made a miracle that all 12 rocks turned into one. They turned into one. Let me ask you a question. When you have 12 rocks, why the rocks turned into one? 
because each rock wanted to be the pillow of the head of the tzaddik, right? Each one wanted to be the support of the head of this tzaddik. So when Hashem saw that, he made all of them into one. But let me ask you a question. Now you have 12 rocks. Take 12 bricks. Turn them into one big square. If the head of the tzaddik is on the right, all the other rocks on the other side do not touch his head anyway. So what do we see from here? Once it's one piece, it, no matter where you touch, it's effect everywhere. But on the other hand, we have something that contradicts it. If a person takes his tefillin to replace the stripes, the stripes are wear off, they're already old, peeling. So when they take out, when they disconnected it, and now let's say after they paint it or whatever, they fix it, they want to connect it back. They're not allowed to connect the opposite side into the tefillin. They have to use the same side that was touching the tefillin, but they're not allowed to take the other side that was loose and now connect it to the, to the actual tefillin. Why? En moridim bakodesh. You do not lower in a, in a holiness. You can keep the same level of holiness or increase it, but you can never lower the, the holiness. Same thing if you have a mezuzah in your main door or in your living room or in your bedroom, which is all the oraita, obligation from the Torah. And then you have a balcony that doesn't have a roof. It's open or a deck. Over there, you don't need mezuzah from the Torah. It's only the Rabbanan. It's gzera shul chachamim to put mezuzah there anyway, even though there's no roof. That mitzvah, it's mitzvah the Rabbanan. It's also important, but not as big as the oraita. So now when you take your mezuzot to check them, if you want to take the one that was in the balcony and put it now in the main door, you're not allowed. Yeah, the opposite. You're allowed to bring it up because he was the Rabbanan. You can bring it higher to the oraita. But you cannot take the main door and move it into the balcony. Until now it was the oraita. You bring it down to rabbinical obligation. You cannot do such thing. So in that case, which one of the two is correct? If we see from here that I connected all the rocks and it counts like one rock and it doesn't matter where the head, meaning every inch of the rock is equally holy. But on the other hand, the stripe, it's not the same. The closer it is to the tefillin, the holier it is. Who can answer this contradiction? Do you understand the question or no? Ah, everybody understood the question or no? No. No? Again, if I have 12 pieces here, 12 rocks like this, one, two, three, and I want to put my head on the first one. So now the first one become holy from the head of Yaakov Avinu. The other 11 are jealous, right? They say, it's not fair. Why you sleep on them? Sleep, put your head on me. So Hashem see that all the rocks won. It's all metaphoric, of course. The rock didn't have a fight over there. Well, just to show you, it's metaphoric. So they want, they all want the tzaddik to put the head, the head on, the, on them. So what happened now? Hashem see that they're all so anxious. He unite all of them into one rock. No more argument. Here, I put my head. All, all 12 of you benefit. So from here we learn that it doesn't matter where the head touch on the table or on the rock. Once it touch, it's like the whole surface. But then on the other hand, when you take the stripe of the tefillin, one side was touching the tefillin, one side is not touching the tefillin. You want to turn it around. The side that was not touching, you want now to connect to the tefillin. And the side that was touching the tefillin will be loose, loose. You're not allowed to do such thing. Why? Because you bring the holy to a lower level. So from here we see that the entire stripe, it's not equal. If it was equal, it doesn't matter which size you connect. The stone is equal. By the stone, it's equal. All 12 were equal into one. Good question, no? Ah, Rabbi, good question or no? Maybe Hashem will give us a good answer by the end of the lecture.
Otherwise, we'll wait for Mashiach to answer. Yeah. Let's say if we, from the 12 stones, we will take one out. Would it make a difference? From the 12 stones, we'll take one out. It's well, still going to be a nice big rock as a pillow to put the head on. It won't make a big difference. So each stone really, it's 8% assistance. You take one stone out, it's no big deal. Obviously, one stone was enough to put the head on. You don't need another 11. The only reason Hashem united them is to show that you want to do the mitzvah so much. I'll give you an example. Sometimes in Yom Kippur, the Sfaradim, they do p'tichat ha'echal shel parnasa. They sell it. The people that want to be rich, they love this opening. P'tichat ha'echal shel parnasa. So the last one, you know what happened? They have one in Arvit, they have one in Shachrit, they have one in Musaf. The last one, in Neila, usually people don't have any more money left. Because <laughs> already the people that put their money, already four people put a lot of money on them. So now the, la the last one, usually they say, oh, we want to do it partnership. <laughs> We want 20 people, each one, to give $100, let's say, whatever, 200 So then all 20 are trying to hold the curtain and move it, but it's, you, don't know, you have no room. Some, some cannot reach. So now when only two hands open and other 18 hands couldn't reach, does it count that they open Ptichat Ha'echal de Parnasa or no? Yes. Yes. What counts, the paying for the mitzvah or actually doing the mitzvah? When you go up to the Torah on Shabbat, you get an aliyah, but you didn't pay for it. So the person that bought you the aliyah, he paid $100 and he gave you the aliyah. The who actually get the reward for the aliyah? The one that went to the aliyah. I who pays and I can prove it to you. No. Because the ladies... I love answers with proofs. How do you know? Because you didn't prove. You only explain that the ladies cannot go up to the Torah, but the only reason, first of all, ladies can go up to the Torah. They can. Why they don't go? Do you know why? It's not modest. But really, there's no problem for a woman to read in the Torah and to make bracha. Bracha, birkot the Torah of the morning, if she's Ashkenazit, she can do no problem. Because, she, you know, they make brachot even when they're not obligated. They're Ashkenazim. As far as it's a different story. Mitzvot ha-sesh ha-zman grama, the women are not obligated. They're not obligated to learn Torah. How are they going to make a bracha on a lie? She's not obligated. But the Ashkenazim say, no, it's shvach, we praise Hashem. It's not for the ladies, it's for the Klal Israel. Elev, ele divrei Elokim chaim. Just like I said before, you can get two answers. They both 100% true, but we have to choose one of them right now. And the Sfaradim went, if a woman is not obligated, she doesn't say the name of Hashem in a bracha. You understand? So now the answer is someone that paid, it's count his aliyah, or it just counts daka, but it counts aliyah of the person that make the bracha. They both get the aliyah. The one so how does it work? The one that make physically the bracha, he get everything. The one is just paid his daka. His sacha is more. Who gets more, Issachar or Zvulun? We spoke about it last week. Who gets bigger reward? Zvulun. The one that sponsored the Talmud Yeshiva get a bigger reward. But who is holier? The one that learns the Torah. So what's more important, to have a loaded bank account in the next world, but not to be holy, 
or to be holy with not such a loaded bank account. Yeah, when you're saying reward, what do you mean that by reward? In no, reward, reward, reward is like the reward is means you have more variety inside, a better connection to Hashem. To the reward can be even in this world that it can get money. It can make money thanks to that, thanks to tzedakah. Many people give tzedakah and makes them rich. You know, I know one guy said to me, you know, I used to give little tzedakah. One day I decided after I listened to your lecture that I have to work on my emunah. I started to give a lot more tzedakah. From the minute I started to give, the more I give, the more I make. You understand? Do you know what the law is when someone goes down on his profit? What should he do? If a person makes a million dollar a year, and this year was a bad year, he went down to 300,000. 70% reduction. What does usually people do? If they have routine tzedakot, he gives 5,000 here, 10,000 there, 1,000 there. Here's a list of people that give them money. Once his business went down 70%, what's the first thing he cut? Instead of firing Sylvia, and Constantinta, and Amiga, and Muhammad, instead of cutting a little bit on the budget, right the way, Rabbi, don't come this month. So what is it like? Let me explain to you in the mashal, parable. <laughs> the mashal is like this. A person has a carriage loaded with merchandise, and he has a horse, and he had four wheels, and then he gets to a swamp, it's very muddy, and the wheels got stuck, and the horse cannot pull it out of the mud. What do you have to do now to help the horse to get the carriage out of the mud? You have to start taking some suitcases, put it down, and take a table down, and take the refrigerator down. You keep taking. You take one more thing, you hit the horse, it still cannot get out. You take another box down, you hit the horse, it doesn't get out. You take another box down, eventually the horse will begin to run. But what does the people do? They take the wheels out. <laughs> they take off the wheels. Now there's any chance to come out of the mud. The wheels are the charity. That's the last thing you take out. First you take everything on top. That's the problem today. Right away people try to cut in its daka. But when a person is on the way down, now it's the time to prove Hashem that you trust Him. You know? Not only I'm not going to cut, I'm going to give another 20%. Eh, Chomrim, Ka'asher avati, avati. I trust you. I know you're not going to let me down. Wait, the rock and the tribe. The tribe already was holy. You're not allowed to change. The rock, they come to be together. No, but the rock, he already put his head on one of them. One was already holy, and then the other one was jealous, so he made a nest, all of them connected. But now his head is on the rock that he puts on his head. So that ha right. what's the other 11? They became holy because now they all became they the one. one part of the one. Right. right? So it doesn't really matter where you put your head. But I'll give you another proof. One brother inherit a special menorah for Hanukkah. We are three weeks before Hanukkah. And the, and the other brother was jealous. So they went to court to bed in to fight for the menorah. The menorah worth a lot of money. It's antique. Silver, nice menorah, handmade. So the rabbis over there said, and this menorah is came from, hundred, from a few hundred years ago from their grand-grand-grandfather, which was a very big holy man. He used to light Hanukkah candle in the menorah. So they came to the bed din, and the rabbi said to them, cut the menorah in the middle. Listen to this. Cut the menorah in the middle, take it to an artist. Each one of you will take half and the artist will complete it into one, the same style. And both of you will have a holy menorah. You understand or no? Yeah. Just like the Babasali water. You know the Babasali water? How come people still have in their house Babasali water 30 years after he passed away? You keep adding. 
the water that you add into the holy blessed water, as soon as they merge together with the water that in the bottle, they also become good. Wine. Same thing wine, same thing many things. They thought about everything. <laughs> to make sure that business will continue forever. Now, so Hashem connected all the stones to one. Yaakov put his head on a rock and, and fell asleep. After 14 years, he did not lay down to sleep. Then he see a ladder full of fire. The legs of the ladder is on the land. The top is in the Shemaim. Angels are going up and down. Angels from, oversea, from overseas, they're going down. Angels from Israel going up. Then Hashem begins to talk to him. And he said, I am the God that supervised and watched your father Abraham, your grandfather Abraham and your father Yitzchak. The land that you lay here, I'm going to give it to you and your children as inheritance. You will have many children like the sand on the ground. Your property will keep expanding to all directions. Even when you go out of Israel to a land that the holiness of God is not there, I promise to be with you there. And I will watch you from Lavan and from Esav. I'll bring you back to the land peacefully. And Yaakov woke up and realized that this is a very special place. He took oil that he had with him and he spilled on that rock. He made it matzeva. And then he called the place Bet El, the house of God. What was the name before? Luz. Where is Luz? Ara Moriah, Moriah Mountain. And he made a vow, if Hashem will walk me through it and watch me until I come back and give me Parnassian clothing and will name himself on me and my children that will all be kosher and righteous, I commit that this rock one day will be an altar to sacrifice sacrifices to Hashem from everything I'm going to have. I will dedicate 10% to Hashem. When Yaakov woke up, the Torah say, Vaira Yaakov me'od. He got very scared. Question we have to ask, if God came to you in a dream and told you that you're very special to him, he loves you very much, and he also loves your father, and he loves your grandfather, and he gives you a personal guarantee that he will watch over you, he will give you money and clothing and protect you from your enemies, and will bring you in safely into the place, what reason you have to get scared? If it would happen today when a person wakes up, right away he called all the reporters from the newspaper to make, right away to come and interview him. How was your dream with God? I had a dream, a revelation. He would create a new religion. Buddha claimed that he saw a little light. 700 million Buddhists you have in the world, thanks to that bluff, right? Yaakov Avinu got very scared. Why he got scared? Who knows? Why did Yaakov get scared? After Hashem promised you you're going to be safe, what do you have to be afraid of? Huh? The answer, if this is the house of God here, this is the entrance to the next world, how did I dare to sleep in such a place? There's an alakha, you're not allowed to sleep in a shul. What happens if you come to a lecture and the speaker there is extremely interesting and half of the people snore? Do you have an obligation to wake up the person next to you because he's sleeping now in a shul? Or leave him alone, poor guy, he had a rough day. Huh? You have to, make, to shake him a little bit. One, one speaker came to, to give a lecture, and one person in the middle of the audience started to snore. So he said to the one next to him, wake him up. He said, no, no, no. You put him to sleep, you will wake him up. <laughs> 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 no, 
what is this? You're throwing the bad things on me? <laughs> One speaker came to speak and he's getting paid. They're paying him for the lecture. But the deal is that you only get paid if you have an audience. If nobody came, you don't get paid. How much is considered audience? They're very lenient in Israel. One person, it's already an audience. You can speak to, at least you can speak to someone, you don't talk to the wall. So the speaker arrives and you see one guy in the audience, he says, ah, I'm so lucky. At least I get a thousand shekel now. So he started to speak and speak, and then in the middle of the lecture he said to the guy, you know how much I appreciate you came, I need this money so bad, thank you for coming. So the guy said to him, listen, cut it out. Please finish already, I'm the next speaker after you. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody showed up, and he spoke for nothing. <laughs> Tov, Yaakov continued on his way to Haran. He arrived to the well. What's the difference between us and our fathers? Our fathers met their, met their wife in the Be'er. Bet Aleph Resh. We, may, we met our wife in the bar, also bet al-fresh. That's the difference between that generation to this generation. He used to be by the Be'er, the well. Eliezer and Rivka by the well. Yaakov and Rachel, the well. Well, well. Everything is well. Why? Well gives water, life, energy. The bar. The bar. Also in the bar, yeah. He gets some machia in the bar. <laughs> so, so now Yaakov, he comes to the well, he asks the shepherd, do you know where are you from? They say from Haran, you know Lavan? You know Lavan? Lavan, it's Otiot Naval. Naval. Makirim, Mashlomo, he say, very good, here is his daughter Rachel came with the, she with the sheep. Yaakov asked them, why are you putting your candle here like you finish your job? But it's still a long day to go until sunset. Give some water to your cattle and continue to take them around to eat. The shepherd explained, they wait for all the shepherds to come now because they all need to roll the stone that cover the well from dirt. That dirt does not go in, so they have to move the stone. But they need a lot of people because it's very heavy rock. As Rachel showing up, Yaakov came to the well and rolled the stone by himself. So what do we see from here? No. We have a very big kushia. The Torah say, Akol kol Yaakov ve'ayadayim yede esav. The goyim are strong in their hands. They know how to fight, they know how to build. They're good with their hands. The Jew is not strong with his hand. He's strong with his mouth, with his wisdom, with his spirituality. I call, call Yaakov. But here we see that Yaakov is even stronger than Esav. I give him one, he make him fly to Ocean Parkway. Oh, we are on Ocean Parkway, <laughs> to Borough Park. So what's going on here? What, are they telling us stories? You see that Yaakov, besides the fact that he was a rabbi and learned Torah, and did not sleep for 14 years, it was very, very strong. Shh. All the shepherds couldn't move the rock. He came, he went like this. <laughs> he rolled already. So what's going on? Ah, good kushiot. The water came up by itself against gravity. Started to come out of the well. The sheep started to drink. Yaakov saw that Rachel is going to be his wife. Beruach HaKodesh. He went and kissed her. Do you know how many books were written about this kiss? <laughs> Do you know how many millions of arguments already in the history took place because of that kiss? There's no kiss in a history that makes so much noise and arguments in a history. Where exactly Yaakov kissed her? 
Did they kiss her on her cheek? Did he kiss her on her hand? A single man is allowed to see a beautiful single girl and come and kiss her on the hand? He's not allowed to shake her hand. Halakha, a man, orthodox man, doesn't, is not allowed to shake hands of anyone, any woman, besides his own wife, his daughter maybe, his mother, fine, but other than that, that's it. Maybe Yaakov just kissed her like this, like we kissed the mezuzah. But also it's not modest. Uh, if you go in a place and you see someone that you like, are you going to go like this to him? <laughs> That's the end of you in a community. So what does it mean? Don't ask me hard questions. <laughs> he started to cry. Now he started to cry. Why did he cy? Huh? Why did he cry? Not because he was embarrassed that he just kissed her. Why was he crying? This entire scene is all Beruach HaKodesh, if you didn't realize it yet. Not that Yaakov was strong, he's not strong, he is weak, he's good with learning, but the miracle is that he could roll a rock that 10 or 20 shepherds cannot do, not because he's very strong. There's a limit to how strong a person can be. One person cannot do the job of 20 easily. It doesn't make sense. It's all a miracle. One step after the other, what happened here? He has the spirit of Hashem on him. Why did he cry? Because he saw that Rachel will not be buried with him. As he told her that he is a relative, Rachel ran to her home after since her mother already passed away. She didn't have a mother. So she came to Lavan, her father, to tell him who arrived. Lavan, what did he think? First thing when he heard that family has arrived, what was the first thing on his mind? He said, that's my lucky day. Business is booming. Why? Maybe he's poor. Why are you, why are you excited? Some, some guests are main burden. They only eat and, and, and consume. They don't, they don't give anything. They just take. How do you know that this guest is going to give? Maybe he's going to take. Why are you so excited? The answer is because he has good record with Eliezer. Eliezer, already the servant of his grandfather, right away brought 10 camels full of all wealth. So that, that's a royal family. They're very wealthy. You know? The Reichman arrived. Well, how bad it can be with such a name? So right away, Lavan ran outside. He's putting a show. Probably Yaakov brought more. But when he saw Yaakov came broke, he doesn't have anything. He started to check his pocket. Oh, how are you? How, <laughs> how are you? Once he couldn't find anything, he went like this on his mouth. Maybe you were hiding the diamonds inside. Why Yaakov didn't have anything? Eliphaz, the son of Esav, already took everything away from him. What clothing Yaakov had on him now when he came to, 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 to his date with Rachel? Uh, let me ask you a question. If now you have a brother that is in the Israeli army and he has one uniform of the Israeli army hanging in a closet and you came home and the, all your clothes is in a, in a laundry and dry clean, you don't have what to wear and you have a date, first date with a girl that's supposed to be your wife. <laughs> Imagine you take the uniform of your brother <laughs> with the kumta like this. <laughs> you put the kumta over here, wear these long, long, long boots like this, and you show up to the day, she come with all the hair, the perfume, the twin towers, heels, 
you're not top of the line dress that she borrowed from Costco because she's going to return it tomorrow. <laughs> she pulled up the whole show. When you show up, small yamin, small yamin. <laughs> they go like this. Good evening. What would happen to your date? <laughs> if there was supposed to be a wife, you can say adios. You're going to meet your commander. <laughs> this is what's happening here. After Yaakov got robbed, he left him with underwear. So when he went into the water, what am I going to do? I don't have what to wear. He saw a dead soldier there, and he took his clothes and wore it. So that means now Yaakov is broke. He comes to the house of Lavan, and he's, he's dressed like a goy, Saddam Hussein. You know the tiger uniforms that Saddam Hussein used to have? He showed up to the house of his family. How the Shidduch worked out? From here you see that when Hashem wants something, even if you wear a sack of potatoes, the Shidduch is yours. Don't have to worry. Not like people think. Five hours in a barber shop, I mean saloon. Shh, shh, shh. No, I make this hair stand like this. <laughs> the other side. We saw from Rivka when she came to meet Yitzchak, right away she covered herself. The opposite of the girls today. Even the ultra modest girls, when they go on a date, they allow themselves a little bit more. Back then it was the other way around. Now when I go to meet my future husband, I better make a good impression as a very modest woman. So, Love and say, okay, money, I'm not going to get out of you, but since you're a relative, come to my home. Yaakov stayed by him how long? Huh? Seven. You have to make up your mind. Seven, 14, uh, 20, 22. Are we talking the, the end or are we talking the whole seven, seven plus seven plus six, wait. Incorrect. Incorrect. Not 100% correct, not even. Where is all the Russian group today? Strike. Why? Strike. What happened? You had a fight with them? Me? Yeah, you. It wasn't me. They didn't miss a lecture for a year already. You're talking 10 Russian people are missing here today. They have a Russian, I was about to say, Russian came from Moscow to give a show. You see? Ah, so. How long Yaakov stay by Lavan? One month. Now, it's just the taste. Soon comes the punch. You know, one Israeli guy, he came from Israel to New York. So his uncle is teaching him the job. So he said, let's go eat something. So they came to a cafe over here. And he say, I need coffee, I'm tired. They say, what coffee you want? Hazelnut, this one, that. All these names, Latche, Shmache. <laughs> this Israeli guy, what does he know, Latche? Man? He say, I want strong Turkish coffee. I say, no, it's not Istanbul over here. <laughs> so his uncle say, I tell you, they don't know what Turkish coffee here over here, but they have espresso. It's also very strong. So he said, okay, so bring espresso. So the waitress, she bought tiny little <laughs> espresso. One sip, it's finished. So the Israeli guy goes like this. Yeah, like this I want. <laughs> he told it's a sample. I remember one time I was invited to the the uh, Holocaust Museum. They have in uh, Washington over there? Where, where is it, the Holocaust Museum? No, no, the big one, the fancy one in Washington. So when they opened it up, one family, they are billionaires, they sponsored the evening, the fundraising. They asked me if I can come. I said, okay, I'll go. I'll, I'll go to the dinner. Glad kosher, fine. So when I went there, you know how these fancy people are. They serve you the plate, everything so fancy. Then you have a little piece of meat. 
half a bite and it's finished. Big plate, tiny thing, and they put some kind of a flower on top of it. Let, give us food, enough with this flower now. <laughs> you sell food, bring food. If charge $500 a plate, at least put an extra two bites of meat. So, one month uh, Yaakov worked there. He was a shepherd of the town of Lavan. After a month, Lavan started to see business now is booming. This is the second time in a Torah that a righteous person that comes to a house of a wicked person brings him a lot of blessing and wealth. Where is the first time? Yosef. 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 You can replace me next Tuesday. <laughs> he knows everything, this guy. Why? No, no, no. I'm saying the se where is an extra time? Not in a chronological order. When is this? The one more time that we found that somebody brought help, wealth to the house of his wicked master. Now we can learn the power of a tzaddik. How important it is to bring the tzaddik into your house. If you are wicked, like Lavan and Potiphar, why Potiphar was wicked? Huh? He just arrived from the gay parade. <laughs> Because he was Potiphar, then he became Potiphar. Yeah, no, they, you know, not Potiphar, Potifera. <laughs> now, it's a good thing you didn't say Cleopatra. <laughs> yes, so now this uh, Potiphar is wicked, and Lavan, we all already know, is the biggest crook. Biggest crook. So, even though the person is filthy and Hashem cannot stand him, whether it's this Goy Potiphar, whether it's this Lavan, it's a person that Hashem doesn't like. But when a tzaddik comes in his house, the Rasha become a billionaire. What's going on here? Please educate me. What's going on here? The tzaddik himself get nothing. Yosef, servant. Servant, cleaning, bringing water. Yaakov, shepherd. Who gets the wealth? The Reshaim. How can it be? The light of the king. That's why they said in the goodbye. True. Give me common sense what's going on over here. The world coming in the world to come? It's, it's the Rasha. What's the incentive of Hashem? For the future. To give the wicked person wealth? Because a tzaddik came to sleep in his house. What, what's, what's behind it? That Hashem should give the reshaim even when the tzaddikim does not come to the house. He has to pay them for the good that they did in this world because they have no world to come. That's not what I ask. I ask right now, a big rabbi came to a house of Michalel Shabbat, Ganav, a big crook. From the minute the rabbi slept there for one month, this crook tripled his business. What, what is going on here? Bracha. Huh? Bracha. Bracha, but why? I don't have bracha. Give me the bracha. Why you give Potiphar the bracha? Hashem wanted to teach, to teach the world how important it is to take care of the tzaddikim and the chachamim. The Gemara says, Kol ha-memale kisem shel talmidei chachamim, someone that makes sure that the pockets of the rabbis, the, those, the scholars, is always full, he gets all the blessing he can think of. Someone that married his daughter to a talmid chacham, big things, the Gemara speaks about it. A lot of things, someone who makes sure that the the house of the Talmidei Chachamim, they have plenty of wine. Wine was very difficult to get, not like today. You come, tsh, tsh, a case of wine. It's different. Everything was handmade. There's no refrigerator. It was difficult. You make sure they have wine all the time. 
you get a special blessing. The law is, if you walk in a, in a, in a fair, in a, you know, they have a, you have a show, like, like, like the Vegas show, uh, uh, Jacob Javits shows, you know, they have a lot of trade shows. All the people that are in business, they're ordinary people. What happens if one of the people that come to sell his diamonds today is a big chacham? He's known as a rabbi, he's writing books, he's important. What do all the people that have booths, what do they have to do as soon as the rabbi showed up? You have 100 booths. Mr. Gavrielov, Mr. Borokhov, Mr. Pachlayov, Mr. Tehrani. All of a sudden, a rabbi showed up. He, he opened up his booth, he puts a little table, open the diamonds, the rings, and he's waiting for customers. What's the halacha, all the boots around, they have to fold their merchandise, close it, wait until he sells all his merchandise. Once he's leaving, they're allowed to open back their merchandise. They're not allowed to sell while he's there. This is the Kvoda Torah. Today, not only people do not respect the Torah, or the people that know Torah, they spit in their face every minute with the help of the internet and Facebook and Schmeisbook and all the rest of the garbage. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Many times a person heard the Talmud Chacham even though the Talmud Chacham forgive, is humbled. I forgive you, it's okay, I forgive you. Bemet, I forgive you, no hard feelings. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not forgive. It's different between two friends. Reuven and Shimon, Reuven insulted Shimon, big time, in public. Reuven came to Shimon, please forgive me, I apologize, it was stupid, it will never happen again, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Shimon said to him, no problem, I forgive you, no hard feeling, Hashem take the problem out of the Reuven's file, dismissed. Case dismissed, it's not in a record. When Reuven died, they don't even talk about it. How did you dare to insult him? Why? This is the power of Mechila. But what happened if this Shimon was a Talmid Chacham? Someone that teaches Torah, someone that gives lectures, someone that writes book, someone that answers halakha every question you ask him. Talmid Chacham. Not everybody has to be Rav Ovalia, yeah? There are many, many average Talmid Chachamim. They all fall into this category. What happened if he hurt, insulted, spoke Lashon Araba, Talmid Chacham, made him bad reputation, made up lies about him? All kinds of things like this. Even if the Talmud Chacham forgave him, Hashem does not forgive him. It says in the Gemara in Masechet Brachot, page 19, and also in Masechet Shabbat, page 119, Hamevaze Talmud Chacham en refua lemakato. Biggest tragedy. One person who insulted a Talmud Chacham. There is no cure for his problem. It's done. The question now is, when, how many times? If you insulted the rabbi once, it's already enough? Or when you do it constantly? One time you made a mistake in time of anger and you insulted him. You done? That's it? No way to fix? Or what it really means that you keep doing it? Non-stop, 10 years, every opportunity, you continue, you continue. Which one of the two make you get lost? No, even one time you get lost. Even one time you get lost. The Sanhedrin says that somebody who is even insulting the Torah's power is very hazakah. I listen to what you say. Let me read to you something. Maase ayab bezman abet Levi, bet Levi. 
Bet Alevi Soloveitchik was very important family with lots of rabbis and Talmidei Chachamim, big time. The Bet Alevi, the butcher in the street, the butcher shop, in, embarrassed him in public. Bet Alevi said to him, Ani mochel, I forgive you. The next day, an ox walked in the street, an ox, a bull, and hit this butcher with his horns in the head and killed him on a spot. It happened in the time of Bet Alevi. The Bet Alevi came to the Chafetz Chaim. He said to the Chafetz Chaim, but I said that I forgive him, and I did forgive him. I, I wasn't upset at him after I forgave him. Why did he have to get, get killed? The Chafetz Chaim say, even if you say it clearly, it's not your fault. He didn't die because of you. Why? The decree was instant. Hashem already wiped him out. This was only the end of the process, but the decree was before you say, Ani mochel. Hashem already said, you insulted this Chacham, you're dead. Two minutes later, he forgave him. Hashem said, too late. The person is finished. The Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, page 119, it says, What is the amount? Now, what is the level required from this Chacham to be called Talmid Chacham? Maybe someone who knows a little Torah and you insulted him, it's not the end of your career. Maybe you can get out of it. The most, the more, the higher his level is, obviously the more problem you have. But where is the red line? Who is considered Talmid Chacham? A 16 years old that finished Shas Mishnayot. He knows now Mishnayot, but he doesn't know Gemara yet. But for 16 years old, it's very nice to know all the Mishnayot, it's very nice. Is he considered Talmid Chacham? So if you insult him, you're done? Is Talmid Chacham is someone who knows how to speak and give lectures about Parashat HaShavua? Is Talmid Chacham is a Rebbe of first grade that teach Chumash? All he really knows is Chumash. The rest is not such an expert. He's a Rebbe of first and second grade. He knows a lot of Chumash. Is he considered Talmid Chacham? Or Talmid Chacham means someone like Rav Eliashiv or Rav Ovadia that no matter what subject in the Torah you talk about, they know, what you, they know everything. Whatever they hear, they know. What does it mean, Talmid Chacham? Every local rabbi or teacher or young uh, tutor that knows a little Torah, is this considered Talmid Chacham? How do we know from what line from now on we go into the dangerous zone? What? How do we know? The answer is Talmid Chacham Gadol, big scholar in Torah, Ze Shoalim Oto Bechol Makom Dvar Alacha Veyodea. The person that no matter anyone comes and asks him a question, Shabbat, Brachot, Nida, Chagim, Yom Tov, business, stealing, interest. Any subject in Judaism, you come and you ask, he knows the answer. If that's the case, you, you don't even have a hundred like this in the whole world today. But any subject, they know exactly everything, by heart, without going and looking and searching and learning for two, three hours to know the... Uh, you don't have that many. So in that case, okay, Baruch Hashem, it's not such a big deal. All the other Chachamim, you can abuse them as much as you want. Of course not. <coughs> Let's see. Here, when the Gemara says, Talmid Chacham in Refua Lemakato, it's speaking about Talmid Chacham that even if he knows Mikra only, only Chumash, only Mishnah, only Alacha, a Rebbe that teach kids in Cheder, if he knows Chumash good enough, is also Talmid Chacham. Do you understand what's going on here? So basically almost every Chacham. So even young, also 16? Even young. 
רב עובדיה, I tell you story, רב עובדיה יוסף came to Israel when I was three years old, from Baghdad, with his father, a little kid. When he was 10 years old, his father was broke. They had a little grocery. No, no parnasa. He had to go back to Baghdad for six months to make money. Six months. Otherwise you're done, there's nothing to eat. The situation in Israel was horrible. How many years ago was that? Avovadia passed away in 93. That was two years ago. Today he should have been 95. 95 minus 10, the story that I'm telling you right now was 85 years ago. 85 years ago. So Avovadia was a 10 years old kid. He went with his father to Baghdad. There were, his father needed to put him in Talmud Torah. The situation in Baghdad 85 years ago went down tremendously. A hundred years ago, 110 years ago, when the Ben Ishchai was there, there was a lot of Chachamim, lots of Chachamim. Then the Zionist, Communist, anti-Torah, enemies of God, they sent their Communist Jews to Baghdad to open a school. What school? Alliance. Boys and girls together. What they call in Israel, Mamlachti Dati. Mamlachti Dati. Boys and girls together, teach Hebrew, teach grammar, teach math, public school. Many of the Iraqis naive people started to send their kids into their school because they had a lot of money. The Sukhnu, they had a lot of money. It was cheaper than Talmud Torah. That's how they got all the good kids from Talmud Torah to go to their school. Today, seven generations later, from all the Sfaradim in the world, the Iraqis are the most anti-religious. Most of them hate religion. They don't want to even hear religion. Why? Because they already disconnected six, seven generations from Hashem. Then you have some Persians also like that. Because right after Iraq, they open in Iran also, school like this. Everywhere they went and took the children from Talmud Torah into public school, there was a holocaust for the community, spiritual holocaust. But in Syria, you don't have this. All the Syrian Jews, until now they're religious there, the few that left there. They didn't have hate for Torah or public school or things like this. You didn't have it. Egypt, same thing. They didn't get there. Places that they got there, they destroyed the religion. Not to talk what they did in Israel. When the Yemenites came, they cut their peot. They destroyed the religion everywhere. They met kibbutzim. They did everything they can to do to the Jews what Antiochus and his friend did not succeed. And believe it or not, they did succeed. They did succeed. They made a horrible damage. Until today, 70, 80, 90 years later, we're still fighting to try to save some of the damages that they made. That's what we're trying to do. The damage that they made, it may take a thousand years to fix. And some of it cannot be fixed. Many of the Jewish soul, that's it. They got destroyed because of them. So, Rav Ovadia went now to Baghdad 85 years ago. He was 10 years old. His father did not have Talmud Torah, one normal Talmud Torah to put him in, in Baghdad, 15, 20 years after the Ben Ishchai. There was already no Talmud Torah for kids. So what did he do? There was one shul where all the old people come to learn and to pray. There's, they have a shiur, there's a rabbi over there, 70, 80 years old rabbi. He teach them Gemara. Every day they learn Gemara. And Rav Ovalia is 10 years old. He said, well, where would I put him? I have to put him with the old people to learn Torah. Can I put him in an alliance? So the little kid Ovadia, that was in Eretz Israel seven years, he came now and he's learning with the guys, which they're all 70 years old and older. As the rabbi was explaining the Tosfot in the Gemara, the rabbi that learned 60 years Torah, it's not a little kid. Lidl Ovadia say, Mechila, Kvodarav, that's not the Pshat in the Tosfot. 
That's not what the Tosfot meant. So he said to him, excuse me, who do you think you are, you little puppet? You'd come to, to, to learn with the old people and you open your mouth? Chatzuf? Chutzpah? So one of the people over there was a nice man. Listen to this story. He said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, don't be upset. It's only a little kid. I'm curious. Let him say what he wants. Let's hear what he, what he means. What, what does he mean? <laughs> so the rabbi said, okay, no, what do you think? He started to explain to them the Tosfot. The, <laughs> the old people did not talk that day after that. They, all said, they couldn't believe it. Ten years old, such a genius. A smart like seven years old he was. Right away, they took him to the Afbedin of Baghdad, Rabbi Salman Khugi Abudi. It was a very big chacham. There were a few chachamim back then, Rabbi Dango. I had a schut. I don't know, maybe I am a Gilgul, something to do with Rabbi Dango. He was the Afbedin of Baghdad also. So maybe 15 years ago, I met his grandson, Roni Dango, who was a laxmith here in Manhattan, not religious, far away. I have the schut, I made him Baal Tshuva. Now, his other cousin in Los Angeles organized my Los Angeles trip. So I said to him, I don't know what my tikkun with your grandfather, the tzaddik, that I had to go and make all his grandsons religious. You understand how it goes? So Avovadia, they took him to the Av Bedin. It was an old Av Bedin. Later he came to Eretz Israel. He was in a Bedin, a Gadol in Yerushalayim. And he became his Chevruta. Ten years old, learning with 70 years old Av Bedin. I want you to show me one Av Bedin today in the world that is 70 years old that will agree to learn one or two hours a day with a little kid. Ten years old, Chevruta. Show me one. If you will find one, a minute later, Mashiach would come. <laughs> this is the way we are. I'm going to learn with 10 years old. You want to embarrass me? Everyone would say that I'm nothing. I'm learning with a little kid. He loved him like his own grandson. This is it. 10 years old. I was able to teach already. You know, in Rav Ovadia, they lived in one room. It wasn't like today. Two kids and a dog, 20 bedrooms in the house. So the two kids are fighting which room tomorrow we're going to sleep in. He's debating the blue, the purple. He's looking around, which room will I sleep? I'm tired of this room, let me move to this room. Back then, 11, 12, 13 kids, father and mother and the grandmother, all in one tiny room. Not like this big shul. Cut it, maybe five pieces from this. That's the house. Five pieces, maybe from here to the bima. That's it. All of them in one room. There was no rooms like today. Jacuzzi here, jacuzzi there, over there. The closet, some people in their bedrooms, their closet, bigger than a bed, the whole room that they lived in. Looks like a, like a suit store. <laughs> I one time went to put Mr. Zot in a house in Riverdale with an assistant. From morning to night, we stick Mr. Zot, we didn't finish. It became dark already. Then when I came to the master bedroom, there was such a long closet. Look how, look how wide this shoe here from there to there. That's how wide the closet was of the woman. And since they didn't have the shelves yet, so all the shoes were on the floor like soldiers. Red, green, yellow, white, black, brown, all, mamash like a shoe store. 300 pairs of shoes. One per day for the whole year. <coughs> Women has obsession to shoes. I don't know why. Maybe they know why. They love shoes. So when Ravovadia was learning, now they have to map the floor. How do you learn when you map, map the floor? He put a chair in the middle of the room, he stand on a chair and we're learning Mara while they're mapping the floor because there's no other room to go to. You understand? And people, this is the life they had. 
Just before we finished, just before we finished, Lavan sees that the blessing came to his house. And then he said to Yaakov, do you think that because you are my family relative, you're going to work for free? What do you want as a salary? Psh, the crook all of a sudden became honest. Listen, I don't want to take advantage on you. Tell me how much I have to, be, to pay you for your work. Why? He doesn't want him to leave. <laughs> Since you came, my business is booming. You are a very good amulet. I don't want to lose you. The Torah says Lavan has two daughters, Leah and Rachel. Leah is older. She's, she's prepared. She was prepared for Esav. But she cried so much not to fall in the hand of this monster until her eyes became soft. What does it mean, ene arakot? The eyelashes of her eyes fell from crying so much. And Rachel is very beautiful, spiritually and physically. Pretty both ways. Sometimes people beautiful from inside, but not from the outside. Sometimes from the outside, but not from the inside. She is inside and outside. And you know the story. Lavan, I'm going to work seven years for Rachel. He Yaakov offered. No problem. He gives him Leah. After that, he has to work seven more years. But he got, he got Rachel a week later. So now, he got, after seven years, now he has two wives. But he had to work seven years. Then he worked, like Michael says, six more years for some, for the cattle, to, get, to, get, to take with him something. 20 years he worked over there. The seven years that he worked for Rachel looked like a week. Like few days. Why? I always tell you the story about my uncle, Alava Shalom. He passed away about a year ago. He was a very wealthy man in Afula, in Israel. He was one of the first people who came to that place when he was all orchards, nothing. Few Arabs walking on a donkey. There was nothing there. My uncle came there in the right time maybe 70 years ago, even before Israel became a state. There was a Persian Jew. He, his last name was Naji. But when he came to Israel, he became Noga. <laughs> After, he was a very, very humble person. If you want to learn humility, he was the right person to learn humility. humility. No matter when, all the stages of his life, he never in his life once felt that it's something special. No matter how millions he had, and another business, and another store, and everyone respected him, he was sitting on the floor playing backgammon with the kids. So never, never in his life, poor, rich, he, he always dressed simple, he had a simple car. His house, private house, was very, very down to earth. His nature was very humble. So, he used to have a big, very successful pizza shop. Very successful pizza shop. People from all over the world come to eat by them. Basketball teams, NBA teams, all kinds of things. Right away they take him over there, because they have one of a kind pizza, until today. So one time, when I was a kid, it was the, the summer vacation, I used to go there eating pizza, and help them in a, in a shop. My, my cousins were working there. So then one time when my parents came, I asked my father, why Uncle Avram worked with the Arabs and cleaned the, the, you know, the, the trays? He has a special thing. He takes the, the dough out, and he put oil, and he makes the dough. Mustafa here, Muhammad is here. And the rich Uncle Avram, with the apron, walk like Mustafa. So as a kid, I asked my father, why he walk like an Arab if he's so rich? So my father said, you know what the difference between him and Mustafa? 
My father said, when Mustafa go like this, he thinks, when will I die already? <laughs> when Uncle Avram go like this, he's thinking 100, 200, <laughs> 300, 400, 1 million, 2 million. <laughs> Do you understand the difference? When you see results, nothing in life is hard. You don't worry. Hard, heavy, shtuyot. How much cash we talking here? When I moved 13 years ago to my house, from an apartment to a house, so there's a Jewish guy, he has a moving company, but all the workers are Spanish goyim. I say to myself, when will I give them the nice tip? By the end of the job, it's not good. Because the entire day that they work, they don't know that I'm going to give them a nice tip. So they're not going to do anything special. They, you know, they make scratches, they throw it here, they throw it there, they break things. I have to show them that I'm nice before the job, not after the job. I give a case of cerveza, beer. I say, amigos, muchachos, cerveza. Ooh, muy bien. Then I took each one of them, say, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50. It was a very big tip for them. All day they work, they make $100, 14 hours. I said, everyone, please do a good job. You had to see how they work. You had to see demons, demons. Ta, 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 ta. Senor, senor, senora. Dick, he takes the thing on his back, go up to the second floor. My wife walks in. No, it's not there. It's supposed to be in this room. No problem, senora. Ta, ta, ta. All day. I said to myself, what fools the people that wait to the end of the job to give the tea? <laughs> By then, the job was done already. You got to make sure to work, make the move. Why they move so nice? This guy paid us good. They have motivation. <laughs> you understand? Same thing over here. Yaakov comes to work for the woman he's in love with. He cares now seven years, 70 years. Give me the work. I'll work 500 years. When a person feels that he gets something in return, he doesn't care about the job. That's what religion is all about. You have two kinds of Jews. You have the Jews that everything they do, that's how they pray. Finished. 18. Two seconds, they sit down. And then you have the ones, like me, crying, connected to Hashem. All day, tefillin, another tefillin, stay extra half an hour after everyone left. What's the difference between him and him? This is a dead person and this is so alive. One does it because I have to do it. I'm not interested to do it, but I, what am I going to do? I'm not going to keep the law. So I, 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 I suffer and do it. And the other one enjoy to do it because he understand every minute I earn eternity. You have to just get your mind to understand that what you do is not for free. You're not doing anyone a favor. How many times the Torah repeat, you know, whatever you do, you do for yourself. There's nothing over here you do for me. I'm perfect with or without your prayers. I'm perfect even when you thief, and I'm perfect when you don't steal. I'm perfect when you keep Shabbat. I'm perfect when you don't keep Shabbat. Nothing you can do in the world that can change my perfectness. Don't think you're doing for me. Yov, in the book of Yov, it's written as a pasuk. If you do something good, what did you help Hashem? If you did a sin, what did you do to Hashem? No matter what you do, you don't change Him. It's the same perfect Hashem all the time. So everything you do, you do for your own bank account in the next world. So what are you complaining? When you go to work and you make money, you complain? No. You only complain when you don't make money or when you don't believe you're going to get paid. When you get paid, nobody complains. That's what Emuna is all about. I am the faithful God that pay reward to my lovers that keep my mitzvot for thousand generations. The Pasuk, Parashat Vait Hanan. I'm not a member in a Knesset or in a Congress who make promises and a minute after the election doesn't remember what we talked about. When Hashem writes in the Torah, whatever you do, you're going to get paid? You're doubting it? 
Well, do you think you're not going to get paid? No, but I want to get paid now. In America, they have a good sentence for it. What do you call people that want to get paid now? Penny wise, dollar foolish. They're willing to give up the dollar because they want the penny now. You understand? So, Mamash, Mamash, before we finish, Lavan was tricking him nonstop. Tricking him one stop. Replace between Rachel and Leah. Rachel cooperate with her sister that she won't be embarrassed. She gave her the signs. There's no electric like today. You turn the light to see who is, who is this, Rachel or Leah? Darkness. People were very modest. She gave her the signs, the password. Who are you? I'm Rachel. <coughs> What's the password? <coughs> Rachel 777. Oh, yeah? No problem. That tomorrow morning, eh, it's Leah. What happened? She gave up. She gave up, she gave up her life, Bechlad, for a sister. That the sister won't be embarrassed. Later, later, the Torah said that Yaakov loved Rachel more than he loved Leah. Not that he hated Leah. He loved her also. She was a tzedeket. She's one of the mothers. But he loved Rachel more. It's perfectly natural. Vadar Hashem kisnua Leah. Hashem saw that Leah is compared to Rachel. She's hated. Not that Chaz Shalom he hated her. It was a tzedek. How can he hate her? But compared to how much she loves Rachel, she's neglected. It's natural. Because Hashem saw that she's not as loved as Rachel, what made her give kids? Half of the tribes came from her. Why? Because she wasn't loved enough. So when you don't get enough love from people, don't worry, Hashem is seeing everything. In the end, you're going to get it. When, you, when people love you and give you attention and gifts, it comes from what Hashem was supposed to give you. Who do you prefer to get, from people or from Hashem? How many orphans that grew up horribly until a certain age, all of a sudden things turned in their life, became successful, billionaires, big empires. Hashem took care of them. We see it all the time. Every time we have a problem, we cry that in the merit of our mother Rachel, Hashem will cancel the decree. Why? Measure for measure. She didn't care about herself. She gave up everything not to embarrass someone else. It makes Hashem owe us. It doesn't owe us anything, of course, but hypothetically speaking, don't ever forget what our mother was willing to do and gave up her own comfort. She gave up everything. For this merit, constantly we get help until this day. Now Yaakov needs to retire. He's quitting his job and he wants to take some shit with him. So now they make a deal that they're going to draw, they, that whatever is born with certain stains will be Yaakov. Whatever is born in a different way will be Lavan. What did Yaakov do? He fooled Lavan. He fooled him. When the sheep comes to drink, they also have relation. When you mix boys and girls in one place, the problem begins. When you take the male sheep and the female and you put them together by the water, the problem begins. Babies come to the world. But something very interesting here. Yaakov is drawing on a stick. So when they become connected, the male and the female, they look at those sticks. And what they see, that's what's born. The Gemara says, Rabbi Yochanan, was a very handsome man. Didn't have a beard. He looked like a woman. It was very pretty. One day he went to swim in a lake 
And the head of the gangster was walking by, Shimon Ben Lakish, his name was. Gangster. He walks from like this, saw a beautiful woman in a, in a lake. Right away he jumped, he swimmed all the way there. And then he said, Oh, it's a man. So I know why you came all the way here. You came all the way here because you thought I'm a woman. Don't worry, my sister is a lot prettier than me. If you become religious, I'll make you my brother-in-law. Come to the yeshiva and start learning Torah with me. He gave him motivation. He came to the yeshiva for a pretty girl. He got the pretty girl and became a legend. The biggest bad tshuva ever. From the head of the mafia, the head of the rabbis. And nobody else, Rabbi Yohanan, was able to learn with. Only with him, because he was so sharp. Everything Rabbi Yohanan said, 20 attacks. So Rabbi Yohanan constantly was enjoying the learning. Once Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish passed away, Rabbi Yohanan, every one day brought him any rabbi, you write rabbi, you write, you write. So I didn't bring you to learn with me to tell me I'm right. Your job is to tell me that I'm not right. That's the learning. Not everything you write, you write, you write. What happened? Ten of his sons died. He stayed perfectly normal. When his chevruta died, he became ill mentally. Couldn't learn, he couldn't live. That's it. So what happened? All the rabbis gathered together and they read Tehillim all day and night for him to die. Begging Hashem, please take him from this world because he's suffering. He doesn't have chevruta. Or chevruta or mituta. That's where it comes from. Either I have chevruta to learn with or I get death. There's no in between. So why do I tell you this story? Rabbi Yochanan, Rish Lakish, was the head of the gangster. A person that is the head, was the head of the gangsters, learning with Rabbi Yochanan, even though they started with such a gap between them. Rabbi Yochanan was so handsome that he was sitting by the gate of the mikveh. When the women come in the night of the mikveh, so when they come out of the water, it wasn't like today, $5 million mikveh here. You know, it was a hole in the ground with some snakes and sand <laughs> and a little bit, a lamp like this and a blanket that you come like this. No, what can you do? So when the women come out of the mikveh, they didn't go into their Lexis. They went into the donkey. You know, on a donkey, she has to go home with a blanket like this to find a way in a, in a forest with the coyotes out there. Think how life was. The women today, chandelier, Italian marble, warm towels, perfumes and creams everywhere. <laughs> Hello, senora. Hello, madame. Mikve, rabbi, primitive. <laughs> the Hilton Hotel, the swimming pool. Ah, all the things that the children leave over there, inside the water, all the oil that all the guidos put on their muscles before they go into the water, become a chicken soup. All the sweat of the people, not to talk about other things over there. Psh, Rachel is swimming. Not disgusting. Mikveh, 100% clean. Nobody leaves any, anything over there. 100% clean. Plus they have chlorides in case there's some germs. Ah, oh, nice. No, primitive. Look how the satan works. In the Hilton Hotel, take the water and go check it in the lab, see what's inside. You will never go to a pool once in your life after that. Once in your life. Check the water of the mikveh. If there's not, it didn't have chloride, you can drink it. That's how clean it is. But the satan already does his job. So they ask Rabbi Yochanan, why are you sitting by the mikveh? Sitting and learning Torah by the mikveh. Why are you sitting here to watch the women come to the mikveh? He said, no. 
When the women come out of the mikveh, it's very important what image they will see first. If they see somebody ugly, they will have ugly kids. If they'll see somebody pretty handsome, that's going to make their kids look better. Since I'm so handsome, I'm sitting by the mikveh. As soon as the woman comes, good evening, Rabbi. They see my beauty. They go home to their husband. They have pretty... So they told him, you're not afraid of Aymara? Everyone looks at your beauty here all day, hundreds of women all week. What a handsome man, Aynara, Aynara, eventually Aynara kills. He said, no, no, I'm from the children of Yosef. The tribe of Yosef, Aynara doesn't touch him. He got a special blessing from Yaakov. That's the story. Yaakov already taught us 1,300 years before Rabbi Yochanan, whatever you see before you become intimate affect the Va the, the, the quality of the baby. They even say there was a case of white couples. Husband and wife, both are white, gave birth to a black baby. What does the husband supposed to think when he has a black baby? Comes to visit his wife, blonde, blue eyes. O.J. Simpson is waiting in a crib. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking you, what are you supposed to think? The answer is, ah, you're cheating. Divorce. You're not coming home. Moshe, you're crazy. I'm from Bess Yaakov. <laughs> First DNA. They did DNA, and the baby was belonged to them. It's a very rare case. How can it be our baby? We bought white. We don't have black DNA. Imagine two black people, they have a blonde baby. Unheard of. Or the other way around. Two Chinese have a Scandinavian baby. Right? Two blonde Germans, Chinese Bruce Lee, their son. This doesn't make sense. But when you do DNA, DNA does not lie. Apparently, guess what? In the bedroom, there was a picture of a black baseball or football player that all day and every night, whenever she was looking at the wall, she saw his face. That's affecting the, 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 the image of the baby. And this is, we learned from this parasha. What do you think the Torah is telling you this story? How many laws you learn from here? One, watch your eyes what you see. Second, spiritual thing, overcome physical laws. Spirituality affects the physical laws of nature. You can die from thoughts. You can get a heart attack. It makes the heart stop to work. How? You didn't press the heart. You didn't stick a knife in the heart. You didn't choke the person. How the heart stop? How we get a panic attack? How he begins to vibrate. How he has all these things. It's all in the mind. All spiritual. Spirituality, it's like in a car. You have a car, you have an engine, you have transmission, you have wheels, you have shocks, you have struts. All these physical things are all working or not working based on how the computer function. The computer mess up in a car, it's a small computer. You restart the computer, they do a special reset, the transmission begins to work. The computer doesn't work, the transmission gets stuck, makes noises. You think the transmission broke. It's nothing to do with the transmission, it's brand new. Something in the programming of the computer affects the entire car. Computer. The mind of a person is a computer, the soul is in a mind, in a brain. The soul is healthy, the body is healthy. The soul is sick, the body is sick. So the Torah teaches us, watch what you're looking at. The second thing the Torah is teaching us, that if your boss is a crook, and he takes advantage on you, not when you're imagining, when you really know he agreed to pay you, I don't know, $20 an hour, and then he cheats you, he pays you only 15, he's still from here, still from the commission, and you know that in the last month he stole from you $1,000, 
if a thousand dollars from, his ha- from him came to your hand, you're allowed to keep it. You don't need to sue him. You can take it. You can do judgment to yourself. If you know for sure, not when you're hallucinating. If you know for sure he stole from your paycheck, you're allowed to take it. It's not stealing. Yaakov has to trick Lavan to get what he deserves. Why? Im naval tit naval. Ata naval ramai mitzvah to cheat you. The same way you cheat us, we will cheat you to get what we deserve. Are we allowed to lie to someone to get what we deserve? What's mine? For instance, you have something that belongs to you, a book, in his shelf, and he denies it. You know he took it from your house, but he denies it. So you come to his wife, and you say to his wife, okay, I'm sorry, I was nearby, I'm stuck, I need a bathroom. Can I use your ba- the bathroom? She says, of course, Gershon, use the bathroom, be my guest. He comes to the bathroom, he makes a right, he takes the book, put it under here, and goes. Is this a thief? No, it's his book. What did he take? He t- I took what's mine. I cannot take what's mine from the hand of the thief. Well, what happens if she doesn't let him in? Is he allowed to push her by force and go in and take it? That's already an argument. Even there is an opinion that even that is allowed. But that's not the halakha. The halakha is you don't break their teeth literally, like the Gemara said. It's you can trick them to get what's yours. The problem today is that people will take what's more than what they deserve. Then you become a thief yourself. Do you understand what the problem is? If he owe you 500 and it, an envelope with $1,000 that was left for him in your mailbox by mistake, and you took it, now you became a thief. Because he owe you 500 but you just took 1000 You're not allowed to take interest, penalty, compensation, sorrow. You have to take what's yours and return the difference. And that's when the people make mistakes. Since they're so angry about the thief, now they take more than they should. That's why you need bed din, Habibi. Bed din, they know exactly. They tell you, no, this is what he has to pay. You finished. But this is it. Any question before we finish? Question? Yes. We don't have doubles today. Doubles is only when they have Bet Amikdash. Now there's no penalty. And Knasot Yoter. Kna- penalty. Double, it's penalty. Not that he really has to give double. He had to return what he stole. But the Torah gave him a penalty. After Bet HaMikdash is destroyed, there's no more penalties. So today, even if you catch a thief, all he has to do is to give what he stole. There's no more doubles today. But when a person dies, Hashem may make him pay double from what he stole. That's yes. But in Bet Din, you cannot get double from a person in this generation. Yes? Um, Is there also a spiritual... Aspect to when a woman leaves the mikveh, what she sees, aside from the physical? Yeah, first, you know, the Gemara said you're not allowed to look at the face of a wicked person because it's affecting your soul negatively. But it's mitzvah to look at the face of a righteous person. Mitzvah to look at his face. Why? You create a spiritual pipe that goes from him into you. However, the question is, if you look at the picture of a tzaddik, does it help just like when you look at his real face, or only when you actually look at his face? That's a good question. If you look at a picture of a big tzaddik, picture, you look at him, does it affect your soul? The answer is no. Only when you actually look at the real face. The real face. One is direct connection. Do you know that the eyes, it's two-way streets. The eyes. The ear is one-way street. Only things goes in. The ear doesn't send anything out. The mouth is a two-way street. Goes in and goes out. The nose goes in, goes out. The eyes technically only goes in. Whatever you see goes in the brain. What goes out? Evil eye. Spiritual signal. People die from Ainara. Person look at something with his narrow, jealous eye, it can affect it. 
Gemara say 99% of the people die from Ayin Ara. Eventually the Ayin Ara is the verdict to finalize what they really deserve to get. You see the eye, Bilam wanted to curse the nation of Israel. Hashem put a cloud to cover them. Why? Because the eye of Bilam can make damage. So you see that by looking at something, it can actually make damage. And sometimes a person can make damage to himself also. How lucky I got. Wow, what did I do to deserve it? Right? The way the Satan says, you see Hashem? Even he admits he doesn't deserve it. The next day you lose it. You understand? It happens a lot. Picture is not uh, effect. No. Uh, a friend, you see a picture of somebody, some, some tzaddik, you say, okay, I'm not doing it. Do this here. It's effective. Ah. By belief. Some it's people true. say we're not allowed to hang pictures of tzaddikim in our house. There's an opinion like this. Because the Torah said, do not make pictures. However, when the Torah spoke about a picture, it didn't, take, it didn't talk about picture from a camera. It talked about the real manual things that people, it used to be half a statue, like 3D. You know those Jerusalem 3D that they have all these things? So they used to build all kinds of idol worshiping images. That's what the Torah meant picture. They used to hang it on a wall and all these goyim come to bow down to it. But picture of a house, picture of family, that's really no problem. The halacha is people put pictures of tzaddikim, but not in a shul. You see, you don't see in shul picture of tzaddikim. You can see outside in the lobby, but inside the shul you don't see any pictures. Why? In a shul we don't take risk. We don't want it to look like we came to idol this picture. Like they go in, they put pictures of their gods, all kinds of things like this. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, it's no problem. If it's random, it's fine. If it's become steady, it's a problem. If it's once in a while they pray there, it's no problem. Yes? I want to clarify the, uh, if you said that when you look at a picture, it doesn't have an effect on you, but the soul, but the story really relating to the picture, the picture is that I cannot hear you because they have a meeting over here. Sorry. Yeah. The story related about the two couple that were white that gave birth to a black baby. Yes. Is that a true story? They it's a true story, to the best of my knowledge. He was looking at that picture that was black. No, so the, at looking at the picture, the, what you see, all images, what you see, affects you. But if you look at the picture of a tzaddik, the special blessing that you get from a face of a tzaddik, you don't get from a picture. That's a different thing. Yeah. When you said he had to trick him in a way to get back what was owed to him. Right. But isn't it supposed to be that a person is supposed to get what he's supposed to get without having to go to bed, deep, fight for the money? Theoretically, if it was supposed to come to him without doing a trickery to get it back from him, he should. Right. Have it without having to do that. But you're allowed to do Ishtadlut. Your question is you know what? With your question, you're going into a dangerous area. Why? I'll tell you why. Because this question has no end. You can say, why you go to work? Aren't you supposed to get what you're supposed to get from Rosh Hashanah? So why are you going to work? Why are you begging people to send you the check? Why are you going to collect rent from your tenant? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Why are you trying to cut on your expenses? Leave! Trust, Hashem will pay everything, don't worry. It's not so simple. Hashem wants us to do Ishtadlut. If you're in 100% trust in Hashem, then you're right. Even Yaakov Avinu had problem with his emunah. The Ramban say about Sarah, about Abraham, about Yaakov. They got some criticism. Yeah. Chazal asked the question, why Yaakov was afraid? Hashem already promised him that he's protected and will get everything. And he still was worried. So the Gemara say he was worried that he will make a scene and lose the blessing. Because all the blessings of Hashem are conditional. That you're not going to make a sin and lose it. But on the other hand, we have a rule. Whatever Hashem promised good must come. While he promised bad is conditional. If you do tshuva, it will get canceled. Bad prophecy doesn't have to happen. Good prophecy must happen. This, this is true. Why Yaakov when she was coming back, was still asking Hashem if the, his promises to get him the land going to come through. He still was checking, and the, the explanation for that was giving is he was checking and he didn't do anything wrong, and the decree of giving him something good 
uh, that that good, uh, the land will be still good uh, for, for his life. Yeah. He was still checking. Checking, no, no. So, so he, even if it was... Uh, the Gemara said the answer, Yaakov was afraid that maybe he made one sin that would cause him to lose all the blessings that Hashem gave him. But it never happened. It never happened in the end. He got the blessings. No, no, not in the end. Alakha. No, Alakha, we're talking the, about the, 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 prophecies. Prophecy. Prophecy. What you're saying is, if something good was promised, prophecy. Can it be, can it not be? promise. Prophecy and promise is two different things. Prophet come and say good prophecy must happen. Okay. He gives a date. Must happen. If he gives a bad prophecy and it didn't happen, it doesn't mean he's a false prophet. It wasn't a, no, no, you don't understand. There are two different kinds of prophecy. There's personal prophecy and prophecy for the world. Do you know how many thousands of prophets we had? Nobody knows who they are. We only know 48 prophets. Why? And seven women. And seven women. Why? 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 Because they have the most significance for the Jewish nation. Because this prophecy was for the time to come, for the world. It's personal prophecy that's not for the generation. It's not even considered prophecy. But if the prophecy is good, it happens. Good prophecy must happen. Question. Wait, one yes. second. Huh? Yeah. But yes. If you, as a Jew, give the law to another Jew, yes. are you at least entitled for the inflation rate? I told him yes, but he wanted to hear it from you. You give him a, a loan before the I inflation? No, you say, when you return to me in three years, which is inflation, 3% a year or 2% a year. Not allowed to charge. Not allowed to charge. You lose the value of your money. It can be also a dollar shekel. You give him when the dollar was four shekel. Then he gives you 10 years later when the dollar went so down to money. three shekel. No, you lose the money and Hashem pays you back the money. That's the trust in Hashem. You don't charge him the depreciation. Louder, please. The Yaakov Shemani in Hashem says clearly when Kibo was asked by him to black king and he is wife, the queen were black and they had a white child. And Kibo told him that one color of the walls, the mind, he says, yes, that's what you're affected. So you have a clear source. Oh, here you go. Yalkut Shimoni? In Yalkut Shimoni, you said? Yalkut Shimoni, Nasso. Very beautiful. Okay, here you go. So you have a source. Yalkut Shimoni was written 1,800 years ago. That what you see affect the nature of the baby. And, and, and it's in the Gemara. The, the Gemara is written that Rabbi Yochanan said for the women to look at him. That's also a very good source. Yeah. Um, you said the reading the speech that about the, you know, bring a dead body into, into Israel. According to the Kabbalah, to the Zohar, you don't bring dead bodies into Israel. So I want to specify, when, you, when Yaakov passed away, they brought his, his dead body into Israel. Alakha, it's allowed. Alakha, it's allowed. Plus, Yaakov is before Matan Torah. It's a different story. Plus, the body of the Tzadikim doesn't have impurity like the body of ordinary people. Yes. Uh, somebody else wanted to ask? Anyone? We'll see you next Tuesday. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.